Jesus said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and tidy up your mat. Immediately, Enias got up. All those who lived in the Lida and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which, when translated, is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothes that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a town named Simon. This is the word. I'm not going to go through the passage this morning starting at the first verse and, and working my way through. I'm going to make some observations throughout it. But the first observation that I want to bring is the repetition of the result of each of the miracles. So in verse 35, all who lived at Lydra and Sharon saw him, and that being Aeneas, healed, and they turned to the Lord. And then at the end of the second section, uh, 42, this became known all over Joppa. Many people believed in the Lord. Now, the thing is, it can't just simply be that these people witnessed a miracle and a miracle and no other insight. So, a miracle minus any other insight leads to a good walk with Christ and a noticeable expansion in the numbers of any Christian fellowship. And the reason we know that to be the case is because the Lord Jesus says it himself. He says, even if people were to see miracles, in and of itself, that's not enough to win people to the gospel, to expand the church, or to make a walk strong. Because the Bible testifies that many, many, many people witnessed many, many, many miracles. And they would find all kinds of other explanations for what just happened. When you think in the Old Testament of the Pharaoh, the king in Egypt, he witnessed 10. 10. I mean, I often say, if I just witnessed one, that would be enough for me, just one. After 10, that king was still unwilling to change and yield in his heart. So, these people as they witnessed the miracle, they must have witnessed something else through the miracle, something else that they could discern from God, and that's what makes the walk strong, and that's what grows the church. If we go one more slide, please, Andrew. I'm going to give you three keys to use in the text. I don't know when it started. Uh, I was maybe one of the very last ever to receive it. It was pretty pointless by the time I was receiving it because I hadn't done what you needed to do in order to get it. But there was a generation of people in the city of Glasgow, men when they were young boys at 16, they entered the heavy industry of the city, normally the shipyards, and you go in at 16, that's day one of your apprenticeship to be a shipwright, which my father was, or some other kind of job. And as you start, unfortunately for them, their friends who took other jobs could out-earn them right away because the money that they got when they were 16 was quite, quite poor. But then it increased a bit when they were 17 in the second year of their apprenticeship. But their friends were still out earning them. And then it would increase again 
as they were 18 and 19 and 20. And then they completed their apprenticeship at the age of 21. They became tradesmen. They called it a journeyman. And they collected what was known as 21 money. At that point, they were out earning all their friends who had not applied themselves to the trades. At home, when they turned 21, they were given the house keys by their parents. This was a sign. They were now an adult. They were part of the economy. They were playing their part in the nation. When I turned 21, I'd only done a few years of study, but symbolically, my parents handed me the keys. And like you, my life has been nothing but keys ever since. Keys for a car, keys for a house, keys for a church building, keys for a squash club that I once belonged to. Now I'm trying not to take keys. When people say, would you be part of this and take a key? I say, no, nope, no, I don't want a key because I'm forever losing keys. But then they turn up again, so don't worry. Um, they're all here anyway, the ones that I need for later today. Three keys over the text. That's what I'll give you. The key, which is love, the caring key, and then the skeleton key. So let's take uh, the first one there, which is the, the power one, I've called it, the power key. What I want you to notice is the movement of what happens when the miracle takes place. The physical movement, not just the internal one, but the external. And Ace had been a paralytic and bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and tidy your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. Then you go to the second section where you see Dorcas. Now, I'm going to assume that Dorcas is lying flat. That's normally what you would do with someone who has died. Peter sent them out the room. He turned towards the dead woman and said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. Seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and he helped her to her feet and he called the believers and the widows and he presented her to them alive and it became known and many believed in the Lord. Let's ponder power for a minute. Uh, many people really are fascinated by it. There's all kinds of university degrees and many people maybe focus on it way too much. But if we could generalize human power, not maybe good examples of it, but common examples, so I'm not saying these are the best examples, but I'm saying they are, I think, the most common. Human power is, by and large, about putting people down. And if you take the power of the police, the power of the police is there to put down anything untoward which would rise up when it seems that... Uh, there's never enough hours in the day for them to put things down because there's forever things rising up. But in theory, police power is to put down that which would rise up and wreck the place. So it kind of makes sense. If you take military power, the military power is used to put things down. Maybe put down another nation so that you can get the resources. Or maybe put down a nation which has come into yours to steal your resources. But the principle would be the same. We want to use power to put something down. If you take the realm of political power, a lot of energy and time is spent amongst politicians, not really promoting themselves, you'll notice, or telling you what they stand for, but by putting down the other group. So you listen to debates and a lot of debating, which is becoming a new fad on television, is nothing really but time spent with one politician simply putting down the other six or four or however many are present at the debate. So 
Not the best example of human power, but I think I can defend it by saying it's a common example of human power. And it's this notion of just putting something down, putting a person down, putting a thinking down, putting a nation down. Then you go to the text. And what does God's power do? The very opposite. It lifts up Aeneas. It lifts up Dorcas. What does the power of God do for the Son of God lying in the grave? It lifts up the Son of God, victorious over the tomb. God's power is about lifting us up. Human power is often about keeping us down. And of course, demonic power is about keeping you down. Satanic power is about keeping you down. God's power is about lifting you up. Lift up your hearts at the table, the great prayer. Response, we lift them up to the Lord. It's about being lifted up in God's power. But of course, you're going to say at this point, well, I just don't have the power <laughs> to lift up someone who is sick. I, I don't have the power to raise the dead. I, I don't even have the power to fix most of the mess of my life. And if that's how you're feeling, if you've never raised a dead person, if you've never raised a sick person, if you're struggling with the disaster zone, which might well be areas of your life, addictions, which if they were to restart now, could be just as powerful as the day they started 15 years ago. You say, I don't have the power. You're absolutely right. None of us do. The mistake is people think they do have the power. The key the text shows us is you've got to learn that little phrase. I can't, but God can. God can do anything. If we read of a miracle and say, that can't happen now, you've turned that book into something from the National Trust. And I don't believe this word is given to us to be a heritage document. It's given to us to be a living word. So when you're looking at all the impossibilities of your life, you're meant to think, I can't. And that's okay, as long as you can follow that up with, but God can. There is not an area of our lives, no matter how impossible in human terms, that the power of God cannot reach. Strength to stand and walk with a loved one through incredibly difficult days. You don't have the power for that, and you'd only be being proud if you thought you did. But in God's power, you can. In God's power, that which is impossible for us becomes possible. When Peter stared at Aeneas, and when Peter stared at Dorcas, he would not think, I, I can straighten these limbs. And without uh, any modern medicine, I can bring back this dead person. He must have thought when he was standing there in both those scenarios, I can't fix this. The difference between Peter, I imagine, and many modern people in modern churches is he didn't stop his thinking at that statement. I can't. But he progressed by to, but God can. So what areas of your life, your work, your family, your prayers, your hopes, did you stop with, I can't? Because you just brought them into your mind, you know? You just brought them into your mind. And in human terms, you just said, I can't. How much of our lives stopped there and never progressed to, but God can. Oh, the kirk's dying. Oh, it's dying. And I can't think of how to energize or how to re-enthuse. Of course you can't. You were never meant to be able to. But God can. There's the first key. Take it, put it on the fob. 
Don't lose it. Here's the second one, the caring key. Notice that when Peter, in both those sections, is introduced to the trouble, what did he do? Again, we're thinking about just movement in the text. I'm just thinking about physically what he's doing. I'm not just processing what he's thinking about. What is he physically doing? And he physically moved towards the issue. He actually got closer to it. Why? Because he cared. He did care. Peter did care. I care, Peter could say. I care about Aeneas lying here lame. I care about Tabitha dead. But he didn't stop with that. He adds in, but God cares more. Have you stopped with I care? I'll tell you how you would know if you have. You know, when you're in the main street, you might have heard of this story. You might have been part of this story. Someone asks, how are you? And you make the mistake of thinking they actually want you to answer. So they say, how are you? And you then say, well, do you know, I've just been told, and when you start, they then, the opposite of Peter, they don't move closer. You can see their face, and they take a step back because actually when they asked how you were, they were not expecting you to tell them how you were. When they ask how you are, that's just a more flamboyant way of saying hello. And sometimes I've been on the receiving end of that experience, the person rolling back. I wasn't expecting you to tell me. I've got to confess, there's been moments when the poker face must have slipped. And I've done that to people. How are you getting on? And then they start and you go, no, no I don't have time for this. I'm, I'm only here to get a pint of milk. Not to be told that you were just told at 11 o'clock this event's happened and it's utterly ruined your life. What do you say in those moments? Well, if you've just got your own key, I suppose you just say, look, I care, but I can't deal with this. Well, our walk with the Lord stays pretty flimsy if that's our approach, and growth in Christian fellowship remains pretty limited if that's the message we preach. But we don't. We can say, like Peter, you can, you can move towards the event. I care, you say. But look, God cares more. And if that's all we've brought into the situation, that's enough. They said when I was training, remember, you don't need to be a savior. The church already has one. Take the key, put it on your fob, don't lose it. The third one, the skeleton key. It's not quite a miracle, but it certainly is a fantastic event. Did you notice it in the text? Well, because of Aeneas and because of Tabitha, you maybe missed the third person, and yet something happens there which is absolutely transformative. Right at the end, you hear of Simon. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. So there's three great events in our reading this morning. There is Aeneas being restored to full physical health. There's Dorcas being restored to full physical life. And then there's Peter going and living for a period of time with Simon the Tanner. And what's remarkable about that is good Jews that wanted to remain pure would not sully themselves with someone like a Tanner because a tanner had to operate around skins and animals and that which was dead in order to make the materials that people would then use for other things. And if you wanted to remain in the good books with your church and a walk with God that you could tell yourself was being pious and holy, you stayed away 
from certain nooks and crannies of your society. You just unplugged from it. And some of them would not even have had a conversation with someone like Simon, let alone stay at Simon's house. And if you stayed at Simon's house, what else would you need to do? I think you would need to drink from Simon's crockery and probably eat from Simon's plate. And who knows, wash in the same place where Simon washed. What is Peter learning? And what do the others learn when they watch Peter do this? Well, it's like a skeleton key. What the Lord says is, after the resurrection of the Son of God over that tomb, and once he had died for sin upon that cross, there is not a section of society out there. There is not a people group out there. There's not a way of thinking which is happening out there, a way of being out there that can turn around and say to us, but you've nothing for us. We don't need you here. You just keep yourself to your church building. Don't get involved in politics. You know that great satanic lie, keep religion out of politics. Well, keep religion out of politics by all means, but get faith into politics. Get gospel people into politics. Or this is, a, this is not, this is scientific. No place for faith. This is science. Some of the greatest founders of modern science were Christian believers. Gregor Mendel, the first geneticist, was an Augustinian monk. And many of the physicists from the Enlightenment benefited from a reformed evangelical Europe that prized education and the expansion of the mind, not in contradiction with God's truth and His revelation in the gospel. But there's not a group out there, no matter what the color of their flag would be, that you cannot reach with the Lord Jesus Christ and win for the gospel. We don't wash our hands of any of them. We don't leave the door locked for any of them because you've got the skeleton key. You've got the Lord, and you remind yourself, there's never a person who has lived or who is living or who will live whose life now and certainly for eternity would not be improved immeasurably by being brought to the Lord who can raise Tabitha, heal Aeneas, and change the heart and practice of a man like Peter. And as we said to the children, of course, there will be times as we follow the Lord with this living word and not a heritage document that we'll pick the ball out of the net of our lives. When relationships fold and when health does not improve and when finances crash and maybe church experience is negative, there are times you'll lift the ball out of the net. But at the end, this is not like following Scotland. The tears are wiped from our eyes. The skeleton key is no door needs to unlock. The caring key, I care, but God cares more. And the power key, I can't, but God can. You don't need to wait till you're 21 to receive these keys. 